honor and uh, the topic of this uh, session is uh, preserving baloch culture and identity and uh, we have with us uh, miss wendy johnson and rizik lutz uh, but uh, mr mumtaz and dida baloch they are on way they are coming to here and for starting of this session uh, i think first i should ask you to start and uh, i will request uh, miss wendy johnson she is a very known baloch activist of, for the cause of the balochistan she has uh, written that uh, the uh, documented she has made a documentary very popular documentary the baloch and uh, she has a master degree in languages and literature of south asia from the university of minnesota she has traveled ex extensively in Pakistan and India and has learned Urdu as well. So that is very good thing. She also manages the website thebaloj.com. This website is really very, one of the, maybe I can say the only authentic website because from this website we take so much cases from this website. Uh, we are thankful to you, Wendy, for your support to our cause and I request you to please present your paper. Thank you. Thank you. Three images I have seen cross my website over the past few years abide in my memory. One is a photo of students in Quetta dressed in white shirts and black slacks lying on the street protesting the lack of places for them at a university. Another is a video of a woman with ropes over her shoulders dragging something as the camera follows her it, it, what, in what appears to be a desert, it soon becomes apparent that this video, and this video is very cinematic, that she is laboriously drawing water from a well, and this is 2009. A third image is a photo of a woman, her face an expression of anguish, resting her cheek against posters depicting the disappeared and the dead in Balochistan. What these people have in common is a desperate need for a solution to their troubles, and that is a decent and representative government. When my friends and I interviewed Khan Suleiman Daoud in 2006, he noted that after World War II, there were winners and there were losers, and that the Baloch were amongst the losers. The Baloch, however, have endured more than just the short end of real politic. Pakistani rule in the province has been characterized by gross human rights violations. The disappearances and murders of Baloch citizens and activists are all well documented, though not common knowledge outside of Pakistan. In addition to political loss and loss of life, the Baloch suffer another type of turning of the screw, as it were. Author and activist Mir Muhammad Ali Talpur recently published an article regarding the sale of vast tracts of farmland in Balochistan province to Middle Eastern countries. Reports indicate that the Gulf states have acquired more than 150,000 hectares of land in Balochistan near Mirani Dam to begin mechanized farming. Mir Mohammed notes that two billion will be spent to hire a security force of 100,000 men to stabilize the investment environment. Now, since 1948, the Baloch have fought five insurgencies against Pakistan in an effort to secure their rights and gain autonomy or regain independence. So while the Pakistan central government is supposedly negotiating with the Baloch province to end this latest insurgency, what does it do? It sells Baloch land to foreign investors. In the US, in manslaughter murder cases, provocation is defined as an act that would cause a reasonable person to lose control. If these sales do not constitute provocation, I don't know what does. 
The sale is evidence of the depraved indifference by which the Pakistani federal government regards the Baloch. The Baloch are amongst the poorest citizens of Pakistan. If the Pakistani government were actually representing the best interests of its citizens, it would have helped local Baloch irrigate that land so that they might instead produce and sell food to those who need it in the Middle East. A legitimate government would not sell the very territory the Baloch have fought five insurgencies to secure. The irony, of course, is that Pakistan is a signatory to the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The third paragraph of the declaration states that human rights should be protected by rule of law so that people are not compelled to rebellion against tyranny. I would argue that actions by successive Pakistani governments would compel any reasonable person to rebel, and many of these acts are even more provocative than those that drove the American states to collectively determine that the British monarchy, by acts of tyranny, could no longer legitimately claim their allegiance. So if Pakistan has proved incapable of claiming the allegiance of the Baloch in its 60 years of rule, what alternatives do the Baloch offer? I don't speak Balochi, and my Urdu is weak. I therefore can't read what is being proposed as solutions within Balochistan in the local languages. As far back as 1957, the National Awami Party, which at various times was comprised of members like Herr Bakshmari, Ataula Mengel, Ghost Baksh Bizenjo, Gul Khan Nasir, and Nawab Akbar Khan Bukti, called for progressive items like land reform, nationalization of industry, etc. And when the party came to power in 1972, it tried during its nine months to implement some very dramatic changes like abolishing the Sardari system. At present, in English, I see calls for autonomy or independence, but as an outsider, what is missing for me is a plan for the peace. What happens when the dust settles? What will peace look like? Producing a clearly articulated plan is important for a number of reasons. One, one can say we are suffering a slow motion genocide. We want our independence back. But that approach doesn't offer potential allies any clues as to how or where their NGO or their organizations might fit in to help you realize your goals. Two, a plan for the peace gives insiders and outsiders a reason to believe that the average Baloch will be better off than under Pakistani rule. After all, if this is not the case, it hardly matters who is ripping off the Baloch. My friend, who works for a labor NGO, recently returned from Nicaragua. There she met a cab driver who was a former Sandinista guerrilla. He was adamant about voting Daniel Ortega out of office. He said in no uncertain terms, while waving his hands at the poverty around him, that this, this is not what we fought and died for. There is a lot at stake in Balochistan, especially with regards to untapped resources. In the absence of a framework and understanding how these will be managed, there is a chance you will find that when the dust settles, those who supported sharing all resources for the purpose of development will suddenly have a very different understanding of what it means to share. The world is rife with evidence that resources do not guarantee development and prosperity. More often than not, resources enrich only a very, very few elites. And the intrigue over these resources won't originate just from within. It will come from without as well. Absent a clear framework that citizens are enthusiastic to see enacted, and more importantly, expect their leaders to adhere to, it is very possible that in this fog, outside forces will peel the Baloch off one by one as the British and the Pakistanis have so successfully done in the past. For since the British became involved in Balochistan in the early 1800s, and since Pakistan strong-armed and conjoled some Baloch areas into joining Pakistan, Balochistan has known nothing but intrigue and subterfuge on the part of outsiders. We witnessed just recently a very bald example of outside pressure. When Balochistan Chief Minister Nawab Raisani canceled an agreement with Tetian Copper, a joint venture with Barrick Gold and Antifagusta, within days, U.S. Ambassador Patterson 
called on the Pakistani government to pressure the Baloch provincial government to honor that agreement. Now this agreement was drawn up with a company, the Swiss firm Covalence, described in a January 2010 report as the 12th least ethical company in the world. The 12th least ethical company in the world. Why would Pakistan and the US government object to the Baloch trying to cut a better deal and a more environmentally sound deal for themselves? Lastly, a plan for the peace provides the Baloch with a chance to introduce yourselves to the world on your terms, to take some control of your profile as it were. At present, to the outsider, the Baloch appear as victims your lives and desires and characters have been painted for the world by the British colonialists and the Pakistani military and government, and they have willingly, avidly described you as a backwards tribal province that doesn't develop because it prefers to be ruled by autocratic sardars who line their pockets versus develop your province. That this is not the case was clear even in 1957 when the NAP, whose members were comprised of many from Sardar families, called for very radical progressive reforms. Additionally, you are at the mercy of the Western media, who generally lump you in with those living in the troubled tribal AFPAC area, identifying you mainly as the hideout of the Quetta Shura. Balochistan has the misfortune of being surrounded by countries with no human rights records of note, at least Haiti's proximity to the United States ensures that social and political activists have often visited and are aware of what has transpired in that country. When Haiti suffered its earthquake, activists were quick to jump on board to monitor how the shock doctrine advocates would try to take advantage of the situation. You have no one in your backyard to do this for you. B. Raman writes that the U.S. is being sucked into Pakistan's world of illusions the question for the bloach is how do, you, how do you do a creative end run around those illusions that the Pakistani government weaves for the U.S.? How to land on the world stage and reveal to the West that you are PLU, people like us? The world by now has a better picture of the Pakistan government and military's duplicitous nature vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban, but it has an incomplete picture of Balochistan. It does not understand what the Baloch are trying to escape, and I think you can paint this picture for them. A couple months ago in New York, I attended a lecture by the famous Slovenian philosopher Slavod Žižek. I'll paraphrase what he said. We are really living in cynical times, forced to act as if we are free. We have choice, but we lack background. In other words, most of us don't have access to the full information needed to make the best decisions. Nevertheless, I think it is possible to reach some general agreement on the overarching goals of an autonomous or independent Balochistan, which can then be communicated to the world of court opinion. How to craft such an agreement? I'm going to throw out a couple of ideals, ideas, and you can poke holes in this later and tell me why it's unrealistic, why it might be unrealistic. But in my outsider opinion, my ideal would be to hold not, necessary, not necessarily a constitutional convention, but a convention in Balochistan, a type of Shahi Jirga, if you like, as Khan Suleiman Daoud held in 2006 to discuss the ICJ case. I would not draft a declaration of independence. You don't want to invite a military crackdown. Rather, this should be a convention designed to discuss issues related to rule of law, management of resources, maybe a constitution. All of these are legitimate topics of discussion given that negotiations are already ongoing in the province with the central government over issues of autonomy. I would invite representatives from each and every political group, every armed group to speak, all chiefs, activists, lawyers, labor leaders, students, every single village that should have a voice in this, whether it's through their own, through a political party or a representative from that village. The diaspora leaders and groups can phone in via Skype, the internet. Each representative in this round table should have a chance to present his ideas related to this agenda. The meeting could be held over a period of days. So at the end of each day, 
representatives can report back to their respective group by a phone or internet regarding what was said and after all have spoken each representative should have a chance to speak again having heard all the presentations had time to consult with party members villagers at home etc in order to gather additional data to bolster his message or to throw his weight behind a better idea at the end of this process the convention should elect a team of lawyers to draft a working agreement for wide dissemination and discussion and at a later date the group can reconvene to offer amendments and perhaps vote on a document and perhaps out of this could come a council that has been discussed elsewhere um, at this point I'm assuming it would look like a really pretty progressive document and people may then not feel that they're operating in such a fog because I hear many calls for unity but I'm it's not clear on what people are unifying behind um, how do you take this to the world of court opinion when so far you haven't been able to get the media to come to you I say publish this text take out a full page ad in the New York Times tell the readers of one of the most widely read newspapers in the world what you are trying to accomplish in this mess that is known as AFPAC. This would win the attention of honorable international players. It educates, it removes the negative, and can claim a huge positive distinguishing Balochistan from Pakistan on your terms. Two of the most important elements in this agreement or working document should relate to rule of law and management of resources. If Balochistan wants to develop swiftly, it can't have a patchwork of laws and methods of enforcing them that vary from tribal area to tribal area. As Ataullah Mangal said in 2006, a tribal system or tribal chieftain will only help as far as the struggle is concerned. After that, it has to again be reshaped into the modern democratic system as prevailing in the international world. We don't have to go back to the Stone Age again and pick up the remains or pieces from there. We have to switch straight away into a democratic system. One needs uniformity and transparency if one is going to do business in the international arena. I had firsthand experience with what happens when a system isn't trusted. When I helped Begum Jamila Daoud build a website to, in part to raise money for Baloch internationally displaced persons, internally displaced persons, we had tremendous difficulty finding a method for her NGO to receive donations. Amazingly, PayPal doesn't work in Pakistan. It works in Albania. It doesn't work in Pakistan. So at present, your small startup businesses, the enthusiastic young entrepreneurs who can help jumpstart an economy, they can't compete in the world market. Equally important is the subject of resource management. Chief Minister Raisani recently called for full autonomy and full Baloch control over resources. My question as an outsider, what does Chief Minister Raisani mean by control? Who will control the resources in an autonomous or independent Balochistan? This is not a simple question. I have spoken to Baloch from all walks of life. There is not one who does not envision and hope for a progressive state with features like social security, unemployment insurance, education, universities, healthcare, technology centers, ecotourism, the only way this is going to happen is with, with revenue from your resources. Now, some Baloch believe that all resources above and below ground should be nationalized. They want to emulate a Norway which tops every single list in the world that measures standards of living metrics. Others believe that control of resources should return to those on whose land they sit with a generous percentage of revenue then contributed to federal coffers. While this latter may be a practical solution, it will probably not lead to the speediest development. The most important reason being, it doesn't allow for efficient planning and it leaves negotiations in the hands of individual property owners, many of whom will be more or less skilled negotiators. In practical terms, it is, it is a transparency and monitoring nightmare. And if the control of resources does not revert to individual landowners, how might they be compensated so that one doesn't feel dispossessed? Such complex matters could benefit greatly from research into how other countries have resolved these issues. How did land use issues unfold in Norway? How were the Indian princely states brought on board when they joined India? This is where Baloch lawyers, educators, and students can step up to the plate. 
all students have to write papers here is an opportunity for university students to produce work and policy papers that can help contribute to the building of a nation ultimately no one should regard control of resources as a means to getting rich if not well managed and shared it is possible these resources will leave a legacy of only a few more SUVs for a few more people and when these resources run out Balochistan is finished if it has developed no options other than to rely on its land for income. A rationale for adopting a Norwegian model, right now a Sardar or landowner may possess copper that is worth a lot in the present market. His neighbor may have nothing, maybe only desert that is fit for goats to graze on, but that perhaps that copper has to travel over his neighbor's land to reach Gwadar. Without use of his neighbor's property and without that port sitting on the property of his coastal neighbors, that copper is useless. And one day his copper will be exhausted. For example, some say that the Chinese will empty Sandak copper mine in 10 years versus 19 years as originally planned. One day that copper owner may have nothing but desert. If, however, the resource had been managed by the state in a transparent fashion, that landowner may now have a pension or social security that is paid by the Baloch government. His children will have jobs that were generated when Balochistan put its development into high gear. His descendants will not have to rely on land as a source of income. If people think long-term versus short-term profits and gains, Balochistan has a chance to emulate an Eastern Norway with sunny beaches. Once there is some general agreement as to how a Baloch government would operate, teams could be organized to reach out to international groups who can help realize your goals. Before coming here, I did a search on eco-friendly mining. It wasn't easy. Some say it's impossible. But I did find a company that is absolutely worth exploring. This company has developed a process by which they extract minerals without using precious water resources. If the Baloch could unite behind a plan for the peace, and an agenda and establish teams to crunch numbers and research the issues that need resolution. When a situation like Tatian arises and the US pressures you to work with a company like Barrick Gold, you can announce to the court of world opinion that we want to do business with an eco-friendly company. We don't want to sacrifice our environment for a couple schools and a clinic that Tatian will provide. We can build those ourselves if we get a fair price for our minerals and our environment isn't destroyed in the process. Environmental activists would jump on board. Greenpeace, Sierra Club, Oceana, they would all be more than willing, you to, willing to help you formulate policy. These research teams could also start to form relationships with environmental monitors. Pakistan recently said in relation to the environmental degradation and lack of oversight at Chinese-run Sandak Copper that the option of engaging some international firm for the scheme was not considered because of the high costs. Sandak generates billions of dollars in revenue. This argument is disingenuous at best. In all of this, the most important element is transparency, checks, and balances. And although I believe that Zizek is right, we are living in cynical times. However, there are still enormous quantities of goodwill out there. And there is goodwill to engage. A while back, I got a Baloch landowner to volunteer to contribute land for wind generation. Our plan was to put up wind turbines on land that wasn't at present in use. All the profits from the wind generation would go to build schools and clinics in Balochistan. I contacted a friend of mine at 3M in the US. He started to research turbines and solar technologies that could function in the Baloch environment. This is where our idealism butted up against reality. First, it was tricky to find accurate and current wind maps, and wind maps of the area. Then there were technical issues related to wind turbines and sand. Anyone who has visited parts of Balochistan knows that the wind carries much more than blue skies. Beyond that, questions of how to connect to the electrical grid, which does not crisscross Balochistan in any convenient or accessible pattern in order to sell the electricity. All these problems have technical solutions, but they may not be yet practical or they need a lot of organization to implement. Developing Balochistan will take patience, diligence, foresight. There is no get rich quick scheme here and the only way this is going to happen is by returning to your cultural roots. 
I was fascinated to learn in Martin Axman's book that Baloch tribes, unlike the Pashtun, were not originally related by blood. Rather, the varieties of ethnic groups, the Jats, the Baloch, the Brahui, gathered, who gathered in this area, this no man's land, they formed tribes. A man contributed to a tribe, to its well-being and its defense, and in return received land. A tribal version of the Latin phrase, unus pro omnibus, omnis pro uno, one for all and all for one. This type of collaboration is what will turn Balochistan into the modern state that so many wish for. What is clear in Martin Axman's book, despite his description of individual foibles, is that the Baloch have, throughout history, worked really, really hard to stay independent. At times, some have been even willing to undermine the unity of a greater Balochistan in an attempt to secure their own autonomy. What is equally clear is that the British and the Pakistanis have worked very hard to undermine Baloch unity when it served their purposes. Nevertheless, this is not the time to run a truth commission. Rather, it is the time to win people over. Your tribal inheritance makes you well suited to concepts of majority rule and sharing. I don't think you need to focus at this point on the failings of individuals. They are only one voice in a majority rule system. In closing, I would like to say this. In relation to the complex issues that lie waiting for resolution, I was reminded of a quote when reading about Aga Nasir Khan in Martin Axman's history. Following the standstill agreement, Baloch, Balochistan's Khan Ahmed Yar Khan issued Kalat's Declaration of Independence. Kalat's constitution called for a lower house of commons. There was, however, at the time, no election machinery in place in Kalat state. The philosopher Zizek says that when we are in a deadlock, we are forced to invent something. So how did one creative soul solve this problem? Aga Nasir went to each area in Jalavan and had local Jirga elders be the electorate. He went to every tehsil or district and conducted elections in Kalat's first house of commons came to being within a week. As Ralph Waldo Emerson said, what lies behind us and lies before us are small matters compared to what lies within us. What lies within the bloach has the power to transform a society, educate the world, and inspire your provincial neighbors, as well as the Sindhis and the Pashtuns. Many bloach, to paraphrase a Greek proverb, have already chosen to plant trees in whose shade they will never live in. Let's do our creative best to honor their memories. Thank you, Andy.